During the reign of the Emperor Nero, the Roman conquest of Britain was less than a generation old. With conquest came Romanization, which meant that Roman immigrants were now flooding onto the island. The king of the Essene, one of the independent tribes here, could see the writing on the wall. So when he died, his will designated three heirs, his two daughters, and the Roman emperor. This was supposed to be a subtle way to peacefully transition the Essene people into the Roman Empire, while upholding the king's daughters at the head of the tribe. It didn't work. The Romans used this as justification to move against the Essene. Soldiers went into their homes, confiscating anything of value. Many of the Essene men were simply taken and sold into slavery, while the women were raped with impunity. Even the king's two daughters were raped, and when their mother, the king's widow, a woman named Boudicca, tried to intervene, she was stripped naked and whipped. After this incident, Boudicca called for a secret meeting with the Essene leadership, and invited many neighboring tribes that had been subjected to similar treatment by the Romans. At this meeting, they agreed to all unite under one banner, and launch an open revolt against the Roman occupation. A vote was held, and Boudicca was elected war queen of the United Tribes. That spring, we're told that the tribes didn't even bother to plant crops. For months, all they did was make weapons, gather supplies, and secretly prepare for war. When summer rolled around, Paulinus, the governor of Britain, took a legion and marched off on campaign. Now if you'll indulge me, I want to follow Paulinus's campaign. We'll come back to Boudicca, don't worry. Paulinus planned to invade the island of Anglesey in Wales, which the Romans called Mona Insula. This island was one of the most important religious sites in Britain, and conquering it would be a huge symbolic victory for the Romans. When they arrived offshore, the soldiers climbed down off their boats and started wading towards the beach. When they got closer, they could see that the beach was packed with druids. They were dressed in black, with their arms raised to the sky, chanting in their native tongue. Accompanying them was a mob of women, also dressed in black, armed with nothing but flaming sticks. The women started screaming like wild animals, and charged into the water while the druids continued chanting on the shore. The Roman soldiers were so petrified with what they saw, that everybody stopped moving, lowered their weapons, and just stared. They couldn't even process what they were seeing. After a long moment, Paulinus started shouting insults at his men, and ordered everyone to charge. That snapped them out of it. It was really no contest. The Romans cut their way through the women all the way to the beach, and when they reached the chanting druids, they cut them down as well. But they slowly realized that the druids weren't just standing on the beach, they were standing on a giant funeral pyre. One of the surviving women, still carrying her flaming stick, lit the pyre, and the entire beach went up in flames, consuming the bodies of the druids. It wasn't until this moment that the Romans realized that this wasn't a battle, this was a massive human sacrifice, and they had just unwittingly participated in it. To a certain extent, the Romans believed in magic. Omens, witchcraft, oracles, sorcery, superstitions, all that stuff was fair game. They also believed that foreign gods were just as real as their own. To them, what they had just done was going to have real-world consequences. What kind of consequences? They didn't know. Just after this incident on Mana Insula, there were reports of strange happenings back east. People said that the English Channel turned blood red. People said that they saw ruins of a destroyed civilization under the Thames River. People said that there were corpses washing up on beaches. People said that a statue to the Roman goddess of victory strangely collapsed for no reason. Were some of these omens invented by later historians? Maybe. We don't know. But if any of these rumors were swirling around at the time, the Romans would have been predisposed to believing them. This was the mood in the air when Boudicca finally launched her revolt. Boudicca's first target was the city of Camulodunum, which was one of the largest Roman settlements in Britain. Messengers from Camulodunum were sent to the cities of Londinium and Longthorpe, saying that a massive army was marching on the city, requesting aid. When Londinium got word of this, they sent 200 unarmed slaves to help restore order, basically a slap in the face. When the messenger arrived at Longthorpe, they actually took the threat seriously. They sent their entire detachment of 2,500 men to help but neither force arrived in time. A small group of soldiers in Camulodunum made a heroic last stand protecting thousands of civilians hiding in a large temple, but after a siege lasting several days, the temple fell, and all of the inhabitants were slaughtered. The residents of Camulodunum were subjected to every horrific indignity you could imagine. Some were hanged, some were crucified, some were tortured to death, some were boiled alive, some were forced to watch as they were disemboweled. 
According to the Roman historian Dio, they hung up naked the noblest and most distinguished women, and then cut off their breasts and sewed them to their mouths, in order to make the victims appear to be eating them. Afterwards, they impaled the women on sharp skewers, running lengthwise through the entire body. The entire population of the city was subjected to stuff like this. No Roman was safe. By this time, Paulinus was starting to get reports that there had been a revolt. He got his men together and set off back east as fast as he could. Longthorpe's 2,500-man relief force was expecting to just march right in there and put down some local uprising. It never even occurred to them that they were dealing with the complete mobilization of the entire Essene people, plus their allies. They were met by Boudicca's forces outside the city. 2,000 were killed and the remaining 500 fled. As Paulinus was en route, he heard of this defeat. All Paulinus had with him was one legion, only 5,000 men. He sent out messengers to every little town along the way, calling up every retired soldier still able to hold a sword and shield. He was able to bring his numbers up to 10,000 this way. There was still another legion, another 5,000 men, stationed in a stronghold to the southwest. Paulinus sent a message to them ordering them to come to his aid, but the guy in charge of the legion at this time, their Primus Pilus, just flat out refused his orders. So Paulinus was stuck with only 10,000 men, and arrived at the city of Londinium just as Boudicca was closing in. He told the locals that he didn't have enough men to effectively mount a defense, and advised them to evacuate the city. He offered the legions protection to anybody who wanted to come with them, and with that he marched north, followed by thousands of refugees. When Boudicca reached Londinium, she subjected the remaining population to the same treatment that Camulodinum had got. They tortured, mutilated, and killed anyone they could find, and then they burned the city to the ground. Boudicca then took off north, in pursuit of Paulinus's legion. Paulinus was headed towards the last surviving large city in Roman Britain, Verulamium. When Paulinus arrived at Verulamium, he advised the inhabitants to evacuate the city, and said that he would protect anybody who came with his legion, just like before. Then he continued north, followed by even more refugees. When Boudicca's forces descended on Verulamium, she had it destroyed in exactly the same manner as the other two cities. At this point, the three largest Roman cities in Britain were simply gone. 80,000 Romans had been massacred, which was a huge percentage of the total Roman population of the province. The entire colonization effort was now in jeopardy. Paulinus continued marching north, but now he was nearing the edge of Roman territory. There wasn't really anywhere left for him to go. He had thousands of refugees with him, very little food, and no hope of receiving reinforcements anytime soon. Paulinus decided to turn and fight. He sent the refugees ahead, and told them to keep walking west until they hit a new settlement near Wales, but he must have known that before long Boudicca would come for them too. According to Dio, Paulinus speaks to his men. It would be better for us to fall fighting bravely than to be captured and impaled to look upon our own entrails cut from our bodies, to be spitted on red-hot skewers, to perish by being melted in boiling water, Britain will be a noble monument for us." Dio liked to invent grandiose speeches, but you get the point. Paulinus didn't think he'd live to see tomorrow. Paulinus found an area with a forest on both sides that would work as a choke point. That's where he chose to fight. Boudicca's army showed up, and it had grown in size. Our best source from this period claims that this was the largest army that Rome had ever faced, and there's some evidence to support this. In Boudicca's army, the women may have outnumbered the men, and most of them were now outfitted with captured Roman weapons. The Essene liked to use chariots, but Boudicca didn't have very many, presumably because most of their horses had been taken by the Romans. Boudicca's massive horde of infantry loosely formed up, and she had her supply wagons brought in and put in a semicircle behind her line. Some people think that this was for non-combatants to watch the battle, but that's kind of a trope in Roman history without a lot of evidence attached to it. I think that it was to prevent the Romans from escaping. Boudicca's forces closed in, and when they were in range, the Romans let loose with their javelins. When they were out of javelins, the Roman infantry formed up into three wedge-like formations, and then without warning, they charged at full speed into Boudicca's line. Paulinus anticipated that they would immediately be surrounded, which is exactly what happened, but the wedges allowed them to fight in several directions at once. Even though they were surrounded, they relentlessly moved forward, hacking through multitudes of Essene. 
Boudicca's surrounding forces bombarded the Romans with arrows, javelins, and stones from all directions, but the Essene were not used to fighting heavy infantry, and most of the missiles were light enough to bounce off Roman shields and armor. Boudicca ordered the few chariots at her disposal to charge into the Roman line several times, but the Romans would just tighten up, hold their ground, and continue pushing forward. After continuing like this all day, there was a break. The Essene were frustrated and exhausted by the Romans' unstoppable machine-like momentum, and they tried to pull back. They started to run into their own wagons, which caused a bit of a traffic jam. Before long, a serious situation developed, where there was a huge crush of Essene pushed up against the wagons, and they couldn't move. The Romans charged into this mass of humanity, and a battle that could have been a stalemate instantaneously turned into a slaughter. The Romans didn't differentiate between man, woman, child, horse, pack animal, they killed everything that moved. Boudicca and some others would escape the slaughter, but she would take her own life by drinking poison a few days later. We're told that including the children and non-combatants, a little less than 80,000 of the Essene were killed. The Romans claimed that only 400 were killed and another 400 wounded, but that seems really low considering the nature and duration of the fighting. In the immediate aftermath, the Romans would do an emergency transfer of 6,000 additional soldiers to Britain, so make of that what you will. And with that, the Roman colonization of Britain was pulled back from the brink. The Emperor Nero briefly thought about abandoning the entire island, but that idea died when he did. The Romans would occupy Britain for the next 300 years, but this was the largest conflict to ever occur on British soil. <laughs>